Fission, fusion, fission, fusion, fission, fusion. Nuclear fission and nuclear fusion all start with radioactivity. It was discovered by a Frenchman named Anton Henri Brecquerel, where he saw that uranium could blacken a photographic plate, even though it was separated by a glass block or black paper. He also then observed that the rays that produced the darkening could also discharge an electroscope. This means that they were charged. This won him the Nobel Prize in Physics along with Brie and Marie Curie. It was in 1934 when Enrico Fermi irradiated uranium with neutrons. He also believed that he had produced a transuranic element, but what he'd actually done was the world's first nuclear fission. You can actually get fission without neutron bombardment. It is rare, but it can still happen. It is known as spontaneous fission. But in the normal world with nuclear reactors, they use neutron bombardment. In a reaction, a subatomic particle or a neutron collides with an atom nucleus, normally uranium-235, which will decay naturally by emitting an alpha particle, that is, two neutrons and two protons. But it is also one of the few elements that can undergo induced fusion. But anyway, a free neutron and uranium-235 collide together. The uranium atom then absorbs a neutron, which immediately makes it unstable, to which it will then split. The splitting of the uranium produces about 200 million electron volts. When it is split, it releases a massive amount of heat and gamma radiation. The two atoms which are left after a split then release beta radiation and gamma radiation. These two high energy neutrons will then collide with other uranium atoms and this reaction continues. This can result in a runaway reaction which is why we use them for atomic bombs. But to do this, we must first enrich a sample so that is 2-3% to more uranium-235 in it. This is what is required by nuclear power stations, but nuclear bombs are at least 90% uranium-235. In reactors, uranium-235 can turn into several different components. It can turn into barium-144 and krypton-90 plus two extra free neutrons. Or it can turn into barium-141 and krypton-92 plus three neutrons, but this outputs less energy, only about 190 million electron volts. Or it can turn into Zincronium-94 and Terillium-139 plus 3 neutrons. This outputs more energy than the second one but is less than the first at about 197 million electron volts. Of course, there is maths behind this. We have something we call binding energy. This is the amount of energy it takes to pull an atom apart. So if we have a graph of binding energy, it would look something like this. A steep line that starts to curve out at about iron then it will continue downwards after that, all the way to somewhere like uranium. Now if we take the binding energy of uranium-235, which is 7.6 mega electron volts, we can then times the amount of protons and neutrons in the atom together to get the energy from this atom, which is about 1,786 mega electron volts. If we then split uranium-235 into barium-141 and krypton-92, and we'll have 8.3 times 141, which is 1170, and 8.8 .8 times 92, which is 809. We can then add these together and see how much extra energy we get. It turns out we get 1979 mega electron volt. That is a difference of 193 mega electron volts in a perfect environment. Now 200 mega electron volts is equal to about 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. That may sound small, but it is millions of times better than petrol. If you are to fill up your car with petrol once a week, you could use uranium-235 instead and it would go for 19,000 years. At about 50 odd dollars for a pound of uranium-235, that ain't bad. Speaking of reactors, a critical fission reactor is the most common type of nuclear reactor. These work by inducing fission by adding neutrons into the mix and let them fuel themselves. They can be controlled using control rods, which are made of components of boron, silver, idium and cadmium to limit how many neutrons can move around. This in turn limits how many reactions can be taking place at once. You can also get subcritical fission reactors, which use natural radioactive decay or particle accelerators to trigger fission. There are three main types of reactors, power reactors which produce electricity for local power networks, research reactors which are intended for scientific, medical, engineering purposes, and the last one is breeder reactors. These are used to get nuclear material from more abundant elements such as uranium-238 is turned into plutonium-239. Thermal breeder reactors are currently being developed and at this moment turn thorium-232 into uranium-233. 
Now this process is also used for fission bombs, otherwise known as atomic bombs or atom bombs. Nuclear weapons were the main motivation to research into nuclear fission. The Manhattan Project were the research and construction of Trinity, the first test bomb, Little Boy and Fat Man, which were the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Little Boy had enough power in it to destroy a large part of the city. It was equivalent to about 15,000 tons of TNT, but nowadays they are over 10 times more powerful and 8 times lighter. Now fission is good, but fusion is better. In 1920, Arthur Eddington proposed that a large amount of energy is released by fusing small nuclei together, which is what powers stars. It wasn't until 9 years later that Atkinson and Hootemann did the calculations for the rate of fusion in stars, and that turned out not to be that fast. The probability of fusion is actually quite low, but it's the sheer number of collisions that happen at once which is enough to keep the star going. If it was a higher probability, the star would burn out incredibly quickly and it just wouldn't exist anymore. In 1939, Hans Best showed how fusion works inside stars which won him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1967. There are requirements for nuclear fusion. For example, there is a sustainable energy barrier, electrostatic force which must be overcome. At large distances, atom nuclei will repel each other, and this gets stronger as they get closer together. So a lot of force is needed to overcome this. It can only be done at temperatures that are incredibly high, and that's why the probability is so low. There are different methods to achieve fusion. The first is called thermonuclear fusion. If matter is sufficiently heated, passed through a gas stage into a plasma, particles travel at high velocities, but velocities can be mapped like this on a frequency graph. Only the particles on the end of the graph, which are the ones that will actually fuse together. This is also the fusion which is used in thermonuclear weapons. This is the only fusion technique so far that has created undeniably large amounts of energy, but we are struggling to control it properly. The next is inertial confinement fusion. This is initiated by heating up and then compressing a fuel. It fuses the nuclei together so fast that they don't have time to repel each other. This is often made by a mixture of isotopes of either hydrogen or helium. Protium, which is the most common form of hydrogen and the most abundant element in the universe, is, consists of one proton and no neutrons. Deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron, can be extracted from salt water. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons, has a half-life of about 10 years and, and can be created by bombarding lithium with neutrons. Helium-3 has two protons and one neutron. Helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons and this is the most common form of helium. The most common fuel is the combination of deuterium and tritium. The third type of fusion is a beam target fusion. This works by accelerating two nuclei in velocity so high that fusion can occur. It is relatively easy to do and can be done very efficiently as well. All it takes is a vacuum tube, two electrodes and a high voltage transformer. Fusion can occur at as little as 10,000 volts between the electrodes. However, the main problem is that most of the energy is wasted on deceleration radiation. That is the radiation released when a charged particle decelerates and will repel the other charged particle. This means that there's no real point to it, it also doesn't release much energy at all. A working fusion reactor has been made, but not one that we can actually use in society. But however, several laboratories across the world, mainly in the USA and Japan, are in the very experimental stages. The reoccurring issue is to maintain the high pressures, high temperatures and magnetic confinement. This meant that every idea has become unsuccessful, a lot of melting and destruction. However, the leading scientists have promised that a working reactor will be done by 2017. We'll see how that goes. The infamous H-bomb actually uses fission and fusion. The fission compresses the fuel and ignites to trigger the fusion. The result is a greater explosive yield, which can cause much more powerful secondary fission explosion. The first test of a prototype hydrogen bomb, Ivy Mike, was carried out in 1952 by the US. The Soviet Union then created RDS-6S, the first ready-to-use bomb on the 12th of August 1953. H-bomb has never been actually used in an attack due to the extreme flare of potential amounts of damage, for example cracking the Earth's crust, vaporizing a city and genetic defamation due to radiation affecting entire populations. The quest for fusion is a great one and it might involve going back to the moon and setting up a base. The moon looks like it has an easily mineable 1 million tons of helium-3, which could all be used for fusion, just 25 tons of which would be enough to power the USA for a year, so you can see why a lot of countries want to put a base on the moon, because if the oil runs out, helium-3 might be their safety net. Now, an ideal situation is where we can create cold fusion, this means get all the energy out without melting everything around you. It's very tricky and hasn't really been achieved yet, but, but some of the top nuclear physicists are actually working on it. 
So soon, we might have cold fusion reactors. So that is the difference between fission and fusion and how we are currently working on it. Make sure you look out for the rest of the series. Bye.